Good afternoon. This is Tuesday, December 12th, 2006. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we're privileged to have with us today retired Captain Thomas Hudner. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. May I ask you where you were born? Fall River, Massachusetts. And when were you born? August of 1924. And where are you living now? Concord, Massachusetts. And your marital status? I'm married. And do you have children? I have uh, four children. There are three stepchildren, children uh, by my wife who uh, whose husband was killed in the Navy, and then we have a, a son of our own. And where and when did you enter the military? I went to the Naval Academy in uh, July of 1943. And did you enter directly out of high school? Yes, after graduation. Did you enjoy your experience in the academy? Uh, for the most part, yes. There, is a, there are a lot of difficult times, which is to be expected in not only the service academies, but uh, institutions like that preparing you for the military. But it was during World War II, and we all felt very strongly about uh, the education we were getting and the career we were preparing for. Do you remember any incidences that stick out in your mind, rather, whether they be issues that were a bit negative or a bit positive during your stay at the academy? I don't re really remember any negative issues. Uh, positive, of course, during the war we were getting news of, of how the wars on, on both fronts were going and almost all of us there were in the academy with the idea of participating in the war so that both good news and bad news about the war had, had quite an effect on us. And um, I graduated in 1946. The war was over in 1945 and a lot of us I think certainly weren't disappointed that the war was over, but disappointed that we wouldn't have been able to take an active part in it. So once you finished graduation, did you get your orders immediately? Oh yes, we all knew uh, probably a couple months before we graduated where we'd be going. And where were you going? I had orders to a cruiser that was out in China which I joined on the 1st of September in Tsingtao, China, a, a cruiser that uh, uh, it, it itself was built just too late to participate in World War II. Do you remember um, a sense of adventure on your part at this point in your life, um, going to China? Had oh. you ever been to China before? Oh, no, absolutely. That's the first time, it's the first time I'd ever been any distance away from home at all. And all of us looked forward to it with great anticipation. And it was a very interesting time. The war was over, but China certainly showed the effects of, of the war that uh, had great impact on that, that whole country. Seeing the impact, what kind of an impression did it leave on you? Because the United States was untouched as far as the physical United States. Yes. Well, to see, first of all, China was a very poor country, at least uh, where we were exposed. Tsingtao was a, a seaport. I'm guessing a couple hundred miles north of Shanghai. And we did operate between Tsingtao Sing, and Shanghai. So we saw the people 
in rural communities as well as the, the big city. And the, the, most of the people we saw were pretty poor. And that was not only because of uh, the war, but they were not a developed country at that time. But uh, we could see the effects of that war. Um, the, the Chinese were a, a very considerate people to us. And it was a very enjoyable experience, both to mix a little bit with the people and to see a foreign country as it was. Going over there at that time, did you have classmates with you? Yes, I did. Um, after graduation from the Naval Academy, half of the class um, went on a month's leave, and the other half uh, went down to uh, Jacksonville, Florida for what we call an aviation orientation. There was li very little emphasis on on training or uh, orientation about uh, the Air Navy. And they realized after the war was over because of the major part that air, air power took in the war that uh, as academy graduates we should have a pretty good familiarity with what it is. At the end of that month we swapped. Those of us who had been on, on uh, leave went down to Jacksonville, and those in Jacksonville went on leave. And then at the end of that time, which was roughly two months after graduation, everybody <coughs> went to ports of em uh, embarkation for uh, ships that were overseas or wherever their duty stations were. And so a number of classmates would, would travel together, for example, we took a ship from uh, San Francisco out to China, and they're probably f f 40 or 50 classmates of ours. Mm -hmm. But there are also a lot of other military people. We went out on a transport which had military families there. And uh, we are, it's, interestingly, we had some uh, Chinese officers, most of them aviation officers, who had been training in the United States. So we, <clears throat> we um, the transport ship that took us out first went to Shanghai and about half of the people on board disembarked there while the rest of us stayed on board and went up to Tsingtao, which was an overnight trip. And that's where seven other classmates of mine and I uh, went to our first ship. And what were your duties on the ship? Well, I was assigned as a uh, the ship signal officer. And uh, it was the signal officer who was in charge of the, the signalmen who were, whose duty station was on, uh, on a bridge up in the superstructure, that, which was just behind the navigation bridge. The, the captain and the officer of the deck and the other people who were controlling the ship. <clears throat> and with this job went the, uh, the job of a, a communications watch officer. So uh, for four hour periods, which are the length of the, the various watches in the Navy, I'd be down in the radio center and uh, processed the messages coming in from the ship and, and uh, those that were being sent from the ship. And although we weren't in charge, we oversaw the work that the uh, radio men were doing down there. It was very interesting because <clears throat> we got all the news and all of the, the directions from a higher authority, so we had a pretty good idea of what was going on at that time. Such as what? Such as what? Yes. Well, at that time, the communists were making, uh, uh, they're, they're, the communists were very anti-American, and there was quite a communist uh, presence both in, up in Tsingtao and down in Shanghai. And uh, um, 
there was a great deal of concern because even though we weren't privy on a lot of the planning and background of it, we could at least see the daily <coughs> events that were going on before anybody would see it in the paper for the most part. And being in communications, we also saw, read about some things that the general public wasn't supposed to know about, and a lot of this had to do with the <coughs> exchange of of Chinese money for American dollars, not only for the uh, um, for the admirals in our fleet, but for the the uh, diplomats ashore. This is something we never would think about, but we saw. We I, I can remember reading uh, several messages about who needed money for what, and it was all on the up and up. But uh, there's probably a little bit of politics in this. But this is when Chiang Kai-shek was the generalissimo out there. And was it Mrs. Mrs. Shek, uh, who was a Wellesley graduate and very world famous, there in the picture in the background all the time. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to be there. So you're a at, at this point, are you a lieutenant in the oh, Navy? Oh, I was, a, I was a lowly ensign. An ensign in the Navy. They don't make them any lower as far as officers go. So as a young ensign, was it intriguing to you to, to be privy to this information uh, early on? Oh, normally you wouldn't, but, but I was in communications, and uh, a lot of this was classified. <clears throat> we had several levels of classification, and we couldn't discuss this with anybody, the, class, the classified stuff. But uh, that was part of our job. But did you discuss it with each other? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. How long were you, uh, when you talk about a cruiser, some individuals watching this tape may not realize how large it is and how many people are on board. A cruiser is, uh, is uh, one, it was one of the larger class of ships that most people are familiar with. Well, I th there are a lot of people that think that almost any naval vessel is a battleship. But a, a battleship is a large, heavily armored ship with big guns, and they fight the, uh, the, they fight the, the big wars. They can fight enemies ashore, they fight one another, they, they fight other vessels. And a cruiser is a smaller version of a battleship. They're a little bit, uh, they're not so heavily armed, and uh, they're a little bit more agile than, than a battleship. But we don't have battleships in the Navy anymore. We do have a battleship down in Fall River, which is the state's veterans memorial. And she, she fought in uh, World War I, in World War II, both in the uh, Atlantic and the Pacific. And uh, they have the battleship Missouri, where the peace, uh, peace papers were signed after the war was over, and she's out in Pearl Harbor now. But um, we have uh, different classes of ships, generally smaller, uh, that perform some of the same functions that the battleships and, and the uh, cruisers did. But the capital ship of the, uh, the Navy now, the big ships, are the aircraft carriers. Mm -hmm. We have 12 of them now, whereas during World War II we had over, or over 60 aircraft carriers, but they were all, all sizes and had uh, various functions. So if I might interrupt, um, the cruiser that you were on and you were in Shangtao, is that how you pronounce it? Qingtao. Qingtao. T-S-I-N-G-T-A-O. That was 65 years ago, and I'm not sure if that's the way they spell it now, because a lot of 
A lot of things Chinese uh, are spelled differently from what they were. So you were on this cruise ship. Did you go from port to port? Did you stay within a certain boundary? You said cruise ship. <laughs> it's a, a cruiser. cruiser. Sorry. <laughs> There's a difference, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, did you go? After the war was over, um, funds for operating were in very short supply. And uh, so we didn't operate very much. But uh, what operations we did do were con conducted at sea. Um, we usually operated with, with uh, a number of destroyers, which are a smaller size ship, probably only half as large as a, as a cruiser would be. And we just perform various uh, naval operations of various sorts to be in a state of readiness, as high a state of readiness at all times, so that um, much more time was spent in port because of the, sh the uh, shortage of money for operating. <clears throat> but we, we used the uh, facilities we had as efficiently as we possibly could. And how long were you in that port? In that ship? The, how long was I in that ship, you say? In the port. Oh, in port. Well, we'd be in port for as long as, as I rem remember it, not very clearly, but uh, about 10 days to two weeks at a time. Then we'd operate maybe three or four days or, or a week and then back into port again. And how long did this go on for? While I was aboard, I went aboard the 1st of September 1946 and <clears throat> left the ship in, when the ship returned to the States in uh, April of 1947. And uh, so during that time, um, well, we'd, we'd be at sea probably a third to a quarter of the time and in port the rest of the time, which is not the most desirable th way to operate, but because of uh, money constraints, that's all we did. So once you were back in the States, what happened next? I had orders waiting for me. The ship's home port was uh, San Pedro, California, not too far from... Uh, Los Angeles, and this was still sh soon enough after the war that a lot of people were getting out, and uh, <clears throat> they needed communicators. And since I was in communications on the ship, uh, I got orders to uh, Pearl Harbor to be on the, the staff of Sink Pack Fleet and went in there as a, as a communications watch officer handling only classified traffic there. When you arrived in Pearl Harbor, you must have seen quite a bit of devastation at the... Um, oh, yeah. How, how did that affect you? Well, it was awe-inspiring to see the, the damage that was done. It was also very impressive to see how much repair had been done. Of course, there were <clears throat> making repairs all during the war, but there's still an awful lot to be done. And it was, it was something to see firsthand, uh, the devastation which was caused six years before. So you were handling classified information? Yes. And how long were you stationed at Pearl Harbor? One year. It would normally, I'd normally have been out there for at least two years, if not three. <coughs> and why was it cut short? Well, it was a it was a very enjoyable tour, and there are a number of us ensigns in the same situation. We'd all been on different type of ships when we when uh, it, and in communications on these various ships that 
two or three of them were, had been on aircraft carriers. There was another one who had been on a, on a cruiser as I had been. And um, the Hawaiian area at that time was a great place to have duty. But I was a young bachelor and I wanted to be at sea. Uh, I felt that I'd spent time <clears throat> being educated to be a, a seaboard officer, so I put in, I, I started looking for somebody on uh, some of the ships coming through Pearl Harbor to see if they want to swap with me for the best duty in the world so that I could go aboard ship. And met, met somebody who had just gotten married and he wanted to, uh, he wanted to get shore duty if he could. So it was arranged that he would be ordered to take my place at Pearl Harbor and I would take his place on a ship. But at the time, <clears throat> the Navy was trying to build up its uh, aviation arm and most of the aviators that had been in World War II were reserve officers, so they got out of the Navy shortly. So this Ensign on the ship got orders from the ship to take my place, but I got orders to flight training instead. So that destroyer went out to uh, China, one officer short, but I got my opportunity to uh, go to Pensacola. Was this something you wanted to do, or was this a bit of a surprise for you? Well, the the circumstances at the time were that the uh, Chief of Naval Personnel had sent out a message to, to the fleet soliciting applications for flight training. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't very excited about flying. The few times I'd flown was very uncomfortable for me. I got air sick. And yet the, the other ensigns with me, my friends were very excited about aviation, so they all s submitted their applications for flight training, and they finally talked me into it, and I somewhat uh, reluctantly put in for it because I didn't want to, I, I wanted to be one of the guys. But we didn't expect to go to flight training until our normal tour of duty was over, and that would have been at least another year. I thought that they were building up a, a bank of names that they could start pulling out when they came up for a change of duty. They saw that this fellow requested flight training, so they sent him to flight training. <clears throat> but they were very anxious to get people, and as soon as my request for a change of duty came in, they decided that instead of my being changed to uh, go aboard a destroyer that I'd go to flight training. So, and I've never regretted it. It was the luckiest thing that ever happened uh, because I just loved the Aviation Navy. So talk about that. You went to Pensacola. Yes. And flight training, did this mean you were training to be a pilot or you were training to be a communications officer oh, on no. a plane? Communications were history okay. as of that time. Mm -hmm. I was trained to be a pilot and um, I happened to be among the very first of my class who went to flight training and during the year and a half of flight training more and more of our, my classmates were in the aviation pipeline so that uh, I got my wings in August of 1949 and uh, ran into classmates all over the place who were in aviation by this time. Do you remember your first experience uh, handling things on your own when you were? In, in an airplane? Right. Well, do I? There's hardly anybody who doesn't. The first solo. And uh, it, it was a real thrill. And uh, I guess 
in spite of my reluctance of actually going to aviation, I always, as a kid, you used to, used to dream of, of flying when you saw the airplanes flying overhead. These were the days when uh, everybody, everybody in the world was talking about Lindbergh, so we, every time a plane flew by, we was always waving up to Lindy, waving at Lindy. So it was quite an exciting thing. So once you got your wings, then did you get new orders? Uh, yes. Before getting you, <clears throat> before getting your wings, uh, it, was, it was a couple months before you actually finished your, your training. You were designated to be a multi-engine pilot or a single-engine pilot. Multi-engine, uh, <clears throat> for the most part, was was land-based, and there were patrol planes, patrol bombers, and the single-engine aircraft were usually carrier-based. <coughs> and uh, of course, by this time, we all wanted to be carrier-based, so I was lucky enough to had drawn straws at that time and drew the the short straw so that I went into uh, carrier type of, uh, of training, in advanced training. And by that you mean you would be on an aircraft carrier? Yes. Your plane would be on the carrier? Okay. Yes. So now, at least half the time in a carrier-based squadron, you were, sh you were ashore. But uh, you're always training ashore to be operating off the carrier when the time came. So tell us about that experience when you first went on a carrier. <laughs> that makes the first solo seem like uh, a dance in the park because uh, the, the very first landing is, is quite exciting. There's practice and practice and practice and practice. Actually, from the first time when you start flight training in the Navy, right from the first time, you learn uh, certain aspects of flying uh, related to how you make a carrier approach. In other words, you make fear relatively slow approaches to any landing. So. That and, and you, you learn to fly the airplane with the, like, what they call by attitude. Attitude is the, uh, the attitude of the airplane, nose high or nose low or um, all of this, doing this flying so you don't have to refer to your instruments very much. But uh, a carrier approach and landing is so precise that all of your training is to make sure that when you're making, when you're operating off a carrier, you can do it with, with as much skill as you can get. So the first landing on a carrier, you're all by yourself. And... Um, for the first time, seeing a, a carrier deck, which is uh, an awful lot smaller area to land in than on a, on a field, uh, makes you breathe a hell of a lot faster. But it's been done tens of thousands of times before, so you know that it, it may be difficult, but it's certainly not impossible and uh, dangerous only to the point that, you, that uh, you're not adept enough to do it, you, they wouldn't, you wouldn't do it if they didn't think you were trained to do it. And there's circumstances that could result in your not being successful and having a crash of one sort. But once the adrenaline, you got used to the adrenaline, and it was, it was just an experience. And were you assigned to a particular carrier at this time? We, the, the, the 
aviation organization is such that <clears throat> we have their air wings, they were called air groups at that time, but air wings comprised of uh, probably four squadrons that may be of different types, they have different missions. And, in a, and then you have some support aircraft, you have photo, photo aircraft, and others that do specialized type of work. And you may have a, a total of 85 different aircraft in this air wing. And for the most part, when you're based ashore, you'll all fly out of a, a, an air station. Um, the first station I went to was a Naval Air Station at Quonset Point, Rhode Island, which is right across Narragansett Bay from the, from the Naval War College in Newport. But then when you went aboard ship, as I say, we'd have about 85, and there'd be, as I say, uh, four squadrons and several what we call detachments of, of uh, planes with specific missions. And uh, we had, th there was a senior officer who was the commander of that air wing, and then each squadron would have its own commander. We'd have about 15 pilots in each. Uh, no, we have about 15 airplanes in each squadron and about 20 to 25 pilots for those airplanes. So during this period of time, were you also readying because of the possibility of another conflict of sorts? Oh yeah, oh. Every, every bit of flying we did was uh, training for some aspect of, of going to war. Mm -hmm. Some of them much more closely related to actual combat, such as going out for gunnery or bombing practice. But, uh, we, well, we would go off on on cross-country flights, but this was to develop our uh, navigational experience, all of it associated with whatever type of flying we had to do. And at this point in time, had you gotten, were you still an ensign or had you gotten up in the um, I became officers? Uh, uh, I think I had been promoted to lieutenant junior grade before I got my wings. Yes, I got my wings in uh, August of 1949, and, and I think I was promoted, along with it, almost everybody else in my class, in uh, June of 1949. So you're in this, I, I, I hate to use wrong terminology, squadron? Yes. And you were initially, you said, in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and then where did you go? We were in, <clears throat> I joined the squadron in Rhode Island in the fall of 1949. And approximately how old were you at this point? 49, I was 25 years old. Still very young. Yeah, still. <laughs> in, in the Aviation Navy, you spend about half your time ashore, as we were at that time at Quonset Point, getting ready to deploy again on the carrier. And so uh, all of the flying <coughs> we did when I got into the squadron was uh, uh, almost every flight was a training flight of one sort or another. And they, they varied considerably what type of flights they were, but they were all part of, of uh, making the pilots uh, proficient in flying under all sorts of weather conditions, proficient in their bombing, in their gunnery, um, anything else they may be called to do. So on the 1st of May in 1950, 
after I'd been in the squadron, that was about six months by that time, we left Quonset Point for a deployment in the Mediterranean, because we always had <clears throat> at le least two aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean. And we were there to show the flag, and at that particular time, uh, Europe was in great unrest. The war was over, but the communists were putting pressure on almost everybody throughout Eastern Europe, I mean, uh, Western Europe, anyhow. And uh, we were just there to be available to uh, back up the, the, uh, our, our country's mission. And uh, again, because of the shortage of money, we didn't operate too much. We spent quite a bit of time in port. But when we would go out, we'd go out with a number of destroyers and conduct operations and exercises uh, simulating uh, wartime uh, activities. While you were in the Mediterranean, you had shore leave and were oh, yeah. able to see sites. What do you remember about parts of Europe then? Well, here now, we were five years after the war was over, but there are a lot of signs all through the southern Europe, the ports we went into, of the effects of the war. <clears throat> Not only the, a, a lot of the um, destruction that we saw, not that we saw a lot because of where we were, but there was destruction and also the people, uh, the, the people had suffered financially from this also, and it made an impression on us. We were well received for the most part wherever we went, but there's still elements who uh, were influenced by the communists who were not very friendly to us. And we had to be careful uh, sometimes when we went out alone and, or in, in pairs. We were always encouraged to uh, have a number of us so that nobody would be tempted to attack us as individuals. And do you ever remember any of that happening? No. We, I was never with a group that, as far as we knew, were even threatened by it. But there were incidents that uh, the, the natives would show their displeasure at the Americans. So you're in the Mediterranean for how long? Well, we, we arrived there in the middle or latter part of, of May. And um, we went to, went to some nice liberty ports. And uh, it was, I remember one Sunday afternoon, it was the Sunday afternoon of June the 26th, that uh, <clears throat> we were in, in the bunk room getting ready to go ashore on, on Liberty. Someone came into the bunk room and said that North Korea had just attacked South Korea. And uh, None of us knew just where Korea was. Korea was not involved in World War II, for the most part. <coughs> it had been occupied by Japan for some uh, quite a few years. And the Japanese did use it uh, as a seaport, but uh, very little was ever said, and very little activity took place there during World War II. So um, we didn't know how that was going to affect us. And we continued to operate in accordance with our original schedule for uh, uh, operations and activities we would do in the Mediterranean <clears throat> until the 8th of August without any of us junior officers knowing anything about it beforehand. But we're awakened by the the strange noises which turned out to be uh, helicopters which were coming from the ship and we went up up uh, 
out on deck, we saw another carrier about a mile away from us, and uh, the helicopters were transferring m uh, men and equipment and supplies <coughs> to this other carrier while we made ready to get uh, to uh, go to go out to Korea. So we we went out to Korea. Couldn't go through the Suez Canal because she, she hadn't been dredged <coughs> at that time to take big ships such as an aircraft carrier. Now they do use the Suez Canal. But made a dash westward through the Mediterranean past Gibraltar and back to uh, Norfolk, Virginia. We didn't go back to Quonset. Norfolk, Virginia spent 10 days there doing some work that had to be done on the ship. And what we, was the ship? What this was, was USS Leyte, L-E-Y-T-E. -E. Aircraft carriers were not usually, uh, at that time, named after battles or after some earlier very famous naval ships and then sometimes after outstanding individuals such as the Franklin D. Roosevelt at that time. But uh, this was for the Battle of the Leyte Gulf, and she came out just after World War II was over. <clears throat> so we spent 10 days in, in Norfolk, actually Portsmouth, Virginia, which is right across from uh, Norfolk, then down through the Panama Canal, and then up to San Diego, and then out to Pearl Harbor and then to Japan, and we started operating on the 8th of, 8th of October, which was uh, about a 20 to, 20 to 22,000 mile run from where we had started. So on October 8th, 1950, Yes. you were actually, all the planning that you had done since your late teens were coming together. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. Tell us what happened. Well, <clears throat> in, these, in those days, well, let me go back a little bit. We, we were sent out to Korea, in spite of the fact that we we're in the Mediterranean, and we'd normally expect the war out there to be fought by a Pacific ships. We had cut back so much after World War II on our military, which is somewhat understandable, uh, but it turns out it was not, it was not a good idea in retrospect. But there was tremendous pressure after having spent better part of four years fighting a world war for people to get out of the military and uh, to decommission ships in the Navy, ships and aircraft, and in the other services, all sorts of armaments. So uh, when we had this situation, which was very desperate, at a very critical time in our history, and that is the communists beginning to spread th throughout the world. And this was a communist-inspired uh, attack that the North Koreans had made, that uh, we weren't ready to fight a war at that time. We had no idea, to the best of my knowledge, th through any intelligence sources, that the North Koreans were going to attack. The uh, Americans were very concerned about the uh, enmity there was between the North and the South Koreans. Uh, they they were uh, very reluctant to provide the South Koreans with any armaments because of the possibility that 
the, the, the South Koreans might attack the North Koreans. But the, uh, the leader, uh, president of South Korea, somebody named Sigmund Rhee, was violently anti-communist. and The Americans uh, were afraid that if they provided too much military assistance to them, especially in the form of armaments, that Sigmund Rhee may attack North Korea. In the meantime, the Soviets were providing all sorts of equipment and materiel and everything to the North Koreans. So it turns out the North Koreans attacked the South. The, um, we're, as I say, we were completely unprepared for it. The uh, South Koreans were very poorly trained. It was a peacetime force they had. <clears throat> the Americans who were out there were not very well trained. And uh, we were very fortunate to have been able to hold on. But President Truman, who uh, came into office when he did, and under the circumstances, has taken the place of uh, our wartime president, uh, President Roosevelt. But President Truman had a great sense of history, and he knew the dangers of communism. And he knew that uh, this attack by a communist nation had to be stopped at all costs. So he ordered aircraft and ships in position to do what they could to help the South Koreans stem the uh, attack. <coughs> and then uh, ordered the Army and Marine Corps units of all sorts to go out to, to uh, Korea to help. And uh, although the South Koreans were forced right to the extreme southern end of Korea, we were, we were all able to take a stand there in what they call Pusan, which was a seaport. They had the Pusan perimeter, but from one day to the next, they didn't know if they might not be able to hold and the South Koreans would be able to force them into the sea. And is that where you were Stationed, your carrier was? No, we were en route. I was telling you this mostly as background mm -hmm. for what we, uh, the, the situation that we arrived in. So, while they were fighting desperately uh, to maintain their position on the South Korean peninsula, General MacArthur came up with a plan to make an amphibious invasion north of, of uh, where the fighting was going on. And on the 15th of September, they had an amphibious operation in Incheon on the west coast of China, which was uh, not too far from the I said China, the west coast of uh, Korea, Korea, which is fairly close to the South Korean capital, Seoul. And uh, this amphibious operation was so successful that it resulted in the uh, North Koreans having to withdraw. And <clears throat> we started pushing them all up north again towards North Korea, and we arrived on the scene the 8th of October, which is three weeks after the invasion, so that the, South, the North Koreans were in, almost in a, in a rout, and it seemed as if the war was, uh, well, the war had taken on a completely different complexion because they were driving the North Koreans back out of uh, South Korea. So when we arrived, and start our first operations on the 8th of October. We arrived in the middle of uh, a campaign that could conceivably have 
proceeded all the way up to the Manchurian border, which was uh, where the Yalu River was, which separated Manchuria from North Korea. <coughs> <coughs> So when you started, your, your squadron started on the Leyte, USS Leyte? Yes. Did you have a sense and did your um, comrades have a sense that this was the real thing? This was dangerous? Were you seeing danger? What was <coughs> happening? Oh yes, we, we knew it was dangerous. None of us, but well, we had a few World War II pilots in our squadron. They had flown World War II. Although that was a very different type of war. It was, it was an air war for the most part uh, for the aviators. But, uh, and this was almost completely a, a ground war. We had almost no naval opposition whatsoever. <clears throat> But we were getting enough news and being briefed enough by our intelligence officers to know how serious this was. The Chinese warned us that if we uh, progressed too far into North Korea and became a threat to China, that is Manchuria, they very, were very outspoken about the fact that, that we may enter the war. And I don't remember if we were very conscious of this warning at our level, <clears throat> if we knew the uh, threats that had been made to us. But um, we, we knew that we were in a war where we are very positively moving north. Um, we had gotten enough ground troops out there, Army and Marines, so that uh, even though the South Korean forces were greatly outnumbered by the North Koreans, our being there made up the difference. So that, and <clears throat> as well trained as the North Koreans were, uh, our technology and the training we had made us a very effective fighting force. So what we were doing as aviators, we're uh, flying in support of the troops, but we also had a number of missions that had nothing to do with the people on the ground, but, but uh, we would attack <coughs> supplies and buildings and truck parks, railroad trains, anything at all that added to the uh, North Korean war effort. We destroyed everything we could. <coughs> but our primary concern was with the troops on the ground. So they had a lot, of, a lot of Air Force aircraft out there doing some of the same thing we were doing. But the disadvantage they had was that often their bases were quite, quite a distance from the scene of action. It was one of the many advantages of uh, carrier aircraft is you move your aircraft carrier around <clears throat> to get closer to where this, the action was or just to avoid bad weather. And if I might ask, when you did these missions, were many of them day missions or night missions? We were, I'd say, 90% day at that time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until after that war was over that the Navy realized that <clears throat> if you're going to fight a war, you had, had to, <coughs> excuse me, had to make the pilots proficient to fly in, in in uh, weather and at night. So each air group would have a small detachment of specialized pilots. And so we had a, a small group of, uh, I think, five aircraft. They call them the all weather people. And they would fly at night and fly under certain uh, con conditions of weather. <clears throat> 
So, uh, but we didn't have the, the capability to uh, conduct normal flight operations after dark. So you personally, on this carrier, would go out with parts of your squadron how often? On a daily basis? Oh, yeah. every, every other day? day? Every, every day. day. Our flights, it was every hour and a half that we, we cycled. And that meant that uh, starting, this was for a 12-hour day, say so starting at 8 o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> we'd launch probably 10 or 15 aircraft, maybe even more, depending upon the type of mission it would be. So we had planes in the air, and then an hour and a half after they left, uh, we'd start, we'd send off another group of aircraft and recover those that had been sent out at 8 o'clock. So at 9.30, we had another cycle, airplanes in the air, and we recover aircraft. And this went on all, all day until finally at 8 o'clock at night, we'd recover our last aircraft. Uh, the jets at that time were still in the uh, elementary phases. Uh, they didn't have much range, they couldn't carry much ordnance, and uh, their primary mission on our ship was to uh, counter any aircraft uh, opposition that we had. They had MiGs. Uh, the, the jet, uh, Soviet jets, but we would stay out. Our missions were usually three hours long. We'd go out, and while we we're out in the operating area, then the ship would send off some more airplanes and be recovering those that they, they went out before. So there, the flights were three hours long, <clears throat> and probably. Uh, We'd have only one flight one day, but the next day we may be called upon to fly two flights. But six hours of flying was pretty tough at that time. And during this, um, these operations, was there a lot of loss of life or loss of aircraft no, on your part? This was still rather early in the war, and uh, we didn't get very much opposition. <clears throat> I can still remember seeing the first anti-aircraft um, the, the bullets coming up, we were wondering what they were. No one had really prepared for us, and the, the intelligence people hadn't told us that we could encounter anti-aircraft. That, that was <clears throat> not nearly as effective as, uh, as it got to be later on, but uh, we had I have to say it, a relatively easy time in view of uh, what the aviators had later on after the North Koreans and the, and the uh, Chinese had developed their, their capabilities. During the time we were there, from 8th of October until the 20th of January, we did lose four pilots. Uh, later on in the war, we lost considerably more, an average uh, uh, much higher. What those numbers would be, I don't know. <clears throat> but the, the two things we had to worry about was uh, surface-to-air ordnance. They didn't have missiles at that time the way that we do now. But we had to worry about <clears throat> the artillery from the ground and also a lot more uh, jets opposing us, and they shot down some of our airplanes, but we shot down an, an awful lot more of theirs. <clears throat> but the, um, the fact of flying off a carrier was fatiguing in itself, and especially if you had any weather involved. And we were there during, uh, during the winter. I think it's been described as that was a 100-year a winter the worst in, in many years. And that itself was very tiring. And uh, we also had to be concerned about uh, 
getting back to the ship, she didn't get caught in weather that uh, made it difficult to get back aboard. So this whole process that you're talking about, how long a time were you in conflict, you yourself and your squadron? Well, the whole time, from the 8th of October, it, we, I mean, we were at <clears throat> all-out bloody war, really the whole time there. So from the 8th of October until the 20th of January, we'd operate for four days. The, sh the carrier would operate for four days, this 12-hour 12, <clears throat> 12 period. There'd be three carriers three and sometimes four aircraft carriers, all operating uh, as a unit, different from the uh, tactics they have today. And uh, on the fifth day, we'd stop flying for half the day while we took on fuel and ammunition and supplies. This was done at sea with uh, the supply ship, whether it's uh, fuel oil or, or ordnance or uh, just dry stores, which in those days were three different types of ship. <clears throat> and say a, a tanker would st be steaming along at 12 knots and a carrier would go up alongside from 100 feet away and they'd throw lines of, and hoses over to us, and then they'd pump the fuel over to us, which in not only fuel oil for the ship, but uh, uh, jet fuel for, for the uh, aircraft. And so uh, they would finish up ref ref refueling and then go to another ship where we got ordnance, bombs, and mostly bombs, but rockets and other ordnance and pull away from them, then go to a supply ship and get the, the food and that type of thing. Now, during this process, were you individually in any close calls? You mean in an airplane? Mm -hmm. No, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be flying during this period. We just stood down. We didn't do any flying at all. Now, I mean when you were in flight and you were um, as you mentioned, when you had um, ground to air, oh, yeah. <clears throat> and it was the first time you had experienced it. After that, you said the war, obviously. No. <coughs> <coughs> we were never attacked by any. When I was doing my flying, I don't ever remember being attacked. We have, may have gotten somebody on the radio calling MIGs at 3 o'clock, uh, 5 miles or something like that, but we were never attacked. Um, we, when we came back to the ship frequently, however, th there would be planes that uh, you'd see small holes in the bottom side of the fuselage of the wings where they'd been sh shot at either by troops or uh, unseen um, anti-aircraft artillery, but um, uh, we were always alert. Very rarely did we, uh, were we concerned about aircraft because we saw so little, and yet as the war went on, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the danger increased considerably, and uh, that was f from enemy aircraft, from much more intense uh, uh, ground fire coming up at, at them, but we got out of there before this was pretty widespread. I notice you're one of our first interviewees who has a very attractive blue ribbon around your neck <laughs> with a star. Can you tell us something about that? Well, it's the Medal of Honor. Uh, on the 4th of December, <clears throat> we're going back a little bit more. <clears throat> 
I, I described about how we had succeeded in turning the war around and driving the, <clears throat> not only the North Koreans by now, but the Chinese who had entered, uh, well, no, the Chinese, I, I shouldn't say that. We had started moving the North Koreans back up north again. And uh, we didn't know whether we were going to go all the way up to the Manchurian border. These were political decisions that we weren't privy to at that time, anyhow. But uh, we knew that at least we'd gotten the North Koreans out of South Korea. On the night of, I think it was November 28th, which was just a day or two after Thanksgiving, General MacArthur had already announced that he was going to have the troops home by Christmas. Um, <clears throat> we were up in the North Korea, well above the 38th parallel, which is the dividing line between North and South Korea. Uh, there was an attack in the, maybe two or three o'clock in the morning when hordes of Chinese came, attacked <clears throat> Arm, ground troops, Army and Marine Corps, overwhelmed them. It is hard to estimate just uh, how much they're outnumbered, but the guess is anywhere from six to one to eight to one. In the middle of the night, the temperatures at night at that time were as, as low as 35 degrees below zero. And uh, it, was, it must have been an absolutely terrifying experience for these guys on the ground. But they, <clears throat> they had such great leadership, the Marines especially had such great leadership that they were able to stay together <clears throat> and we're making an orderly withdrawal. They don't call it a retreat, but an orderly withdrawal <clears throat> down the sides of the mountains. And they were up, as, uh, uh, up pretty high up in the mountains. There's snow on the ground. And they're very narrow mountain roads. And uh, they they were uh, trying to get the hell away from the Chinese who were attacking them, and the Chinese were absolutely savage fighters. <laughs> On the 4th of December, we had a, <clears throat> a group of us were, was assigned to what they call an armed reconnaissance uh, mission. <coughs> that was one where we would not given any specific targets, but we were to uh, attack targets of opportunity, whether they're enemy troops or munitions or truck parks or buildings that seem to have any ta tactical or strategic advantage, but destroy anything that uh, would hurt the enemy. And. Uh, we had taken off about 1 or 1.30 in the afternoon. It was probably about 3 o'clock when uh, the fellow whom I was flying wing on, that means that I was flying cl fairly close to, but behind and to the side of, of one of the other pilots. We usually flew in formations of four. So uh, my uh, section leader, his name is Jesse Brown, called that he th thought he had been hit. He was, he was losing oil pressure. He was going to have to crash. Well, the territory around there was just it was covered with uh, scrub pine. Uh, almost the whole area was as it is in, in uh, areas like that. And we saw 
a clear opening probably a half a mile away, and Jesse had enough altitude so that he was able to get to that clear space and landed his airplane with his wheels up, of course, and then, but hit the ground with such intensity that it buckled a, buckled a, a fuselage of the airplane and his canopy, which had been open at the time that he hit the ground, it slammed shut. And from the condition of the airplane, uh, there was no question in the minds of any of us but that he perished in the, in the crash. So our flight leader left us, left the flight to climb to higher altitude to radio for a rescue helicopter if one was available. And the Marines who were fighting in the vicinity almost always had a helicopter there to act as observation and sometimes in an emergency to pick up uh, wounded troops. Well, while the flight leader was gone, we saw that Jesse had opened the canopy of his airplane and waved at us to let us know that he was alive, which surprised us. Then the flight leader came back and said that uh, a helicopter was on the way, but it'd probably take uh, a while before it could get there. And uh, as I remember, it would be at least half an hour before he could get there, maybe even 45 minutes. But then we noticed that smoke was coming out from under the cowling of the airplane, which indicated fire. And I figured, that uh, whatever was causing that smoke was a fire that could eventually envelop the whole airplane. <clears throat> and the, if a rescue helicopter came up, he would get there too late. So I made the decision to um, make a crash landing near, near Jesse's airplane and uh, just pull him out of the cockpit. And then we'd pull over, pull him over, cup, uh, away from the plane and just wait for the helicopter. So uh, when you, if you're going to have to make a crash landing, you never, you never have your wheels down because if you hit the ground like that, you could flip right over on your back. So I made a, a wheels up landing and there was a slope, maybe 20 degrees upslope. <coughs> And I dropped all of my ordnance. I had rockets and uh, had extra a fuel, external fuel tank. And then I had a lot of 50 caliber ammunition. So I flew around, drop, dropped all this stuff, and made the type of approach that I'd make to an aircraft carrier, which was as slow as you could get safely, just to get the feel of it. It came around again and then intended to get a little bit below the <clears throat> landing spot and then f sort of fly up parallel to the, to the slope. But what I didn't realize is that I was also what we call mushing a little bit. So I wasn't just flying parallel, but I was coming down. So when I hit the ground, it was pretty hard. <coughs> <coughs> but uh, it was successful. It, it was a wild ride. And uh, yet I was okay. So uh, I, I got out of the airplane. It was, it was about 100 yards away from Jesse's airplane, I think. And uh, when he saw me approaching the, the plane, he said something to the effect, we've got to figure out a way to get out of here. Very calm. And, and I saw the reason he didn't get out is because the fuselage was actually bent at the cockpit, maybe 20, 20 or 30 degrees. And his knee was caught beside the, between the uh, inside of the cockpit and a control panel that, was between our legs when, when we flew.
Well, because of the snow on the ground, ice was packed on the soles of my boots. And the configuration of that, that airplane, it was an F4U Corsair. It was one where the wings came down. Instead of straight out from the fuselage, they came down about two or three feet and then came up again. And there was no, no horizontal space on that airplane. <clears throat> and so to get up into the, to look into the cockpit, I had to use both hands. And uh, when I saw what happened, when I reached in, I was having to hold on with one hand, and it was very difficult to hang on. So there's no way I could move him. But he had, after, after the crash, he, he unbuckled his parachute. And the parachutes at that time, anyhow, were buckled in three places, one across the chest and then one across each leg. And he'd taken off his gloves to uh, unbuckle the chute and he dropped them on the floor of the airplane. And by the time I got to him, his, his fingers were just frozen solid. And he'd taken off his helmet. And I used to carry around a, 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 a blue navy, what we call a watch cap. It was a woolen cap. Pull that down over his head. And I had a, I took my scarf off and then wrapped it around his hands, which did no good at all. But um, there was just nothing I could do. So I ran back to my airplane, and the radio was still working, and called, explained the situation to the people in the air, and asked if they could have the helicopter bring a, a fire extinguisher and an, and a, an axe. And then went back to Jesse, but it was very difficult talking with him. Uh, he didn't indicate he was under any pain, but I realized later on he must have been in a terrible state of shock because of, of the landing. And uh, he seemed to lapse off either in unconsciousness or extreme uh, fatigue or whatever it was, but we didn't communicate very much. There wasn't much to talk about. So then I, I scooped up some snow and threw it under the cowling. What is a cowling? The cowling is uh, <clears throat> which surrounds the engine on the nose of the airplane. is designed to uh, maximize the flow of air around the engine so to keep it relatively cool in flight or on the ground. But throwing snow on there did nothing to abate the, uh, the smoke at all. <clears throat> it wasn't great volumes of, sm of smoke, but it was enough to indicate that something was burning. So. Uh, after about half or three quarters of an hour, the helicopter did arrive. And it took a while before he landed. And we used to carry on. The equipment we had in those days was relatively basic compared to the equipment they have nowadays. But we always wore uh, these yellow life jackets. <coughs> <coughs> And hanging on the jacket was several things. We'd <clears throat> have an emergency knife to, carry, to cut parachute shrouds. But one of them was a <clears throat> called a die marker and smoke signal. And it was a, a tube about uh, four or five inches long, about an inch and a half in diameter. <clears throat> you pull one end of it off. And um, it would, em if you're in the water, it would em emit this uh, uh, yellow-green material that spread out a, a, 
a wide <coughs> swath that could be seen for miles away in case you're in the water. And on the other end was a, a smoke bomb. And you pull the cap of that off and it just s smokes. So it, it's a signal so that you can be seen from the air much more easily. So if, as the helicopter was hovering around, I thought he was trying to figure out where the wind was coming from. So I pulled the, the cap and the smoke came out and he finally landed. And the reason he was so concerned is that the brakes of his aircraft were unreliable. And he was afraid of landing someplace and then having the airplane roll down the mountain, which would have been a lot of fun. But it, uh, uh, he, he landed okay. Now what I haven't mentioned is yet is Jesse Brown was the Navy's first black aviator. And he was a very, very unusual person. And uh, if I may say, he stuck out like a sore thumb in, a, in an all-white Navy. Did you know him personally? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, we weren't the closest of friends, but he had his friends in the squadron. He had friends in other squadrons, but particularly our squadron. But my close friends, four or five in that squadron, I think they're all, they weren't all Naval Academy, but um, we had the, sort of the same backgrounds. And then Jesse had some very good friends who were very protective of him. And, and yet we were all, as a squad, we were all very close. Uh, morale in a, in a squadron at that time, uh, for the most part, was always very good. But while we transited the Pacific, or even coming down from Norfolk, um, we'll back up a little bit. When we left Norfolk, we had, they had loaded six helicopters on board and 10 marine pilots. And we were gonna take those helicopters out <clears throat> to Korea so that they would fly in support of the Marines on the ground. So we spent quite a while on that ship. Nobody could, you know, we're, we were going across time zones and very hard sleeping. But the Marines didn't have any assignments at all. That They were just to be there with their airplanes. And of course, they had a lot to do when they got there. But they all got to know who Jesse Brown was. And uh, <clears throat> so when this Marine pilot got out of his airplane, I recognized him because of the time we'd spent coming across the, the Pacific. His name was Charlie Ward, First Lieutenant Charlie Ward. I recognized him. He may, have, may or may not have recognized me, but when he got into the cockpit of that other airplane and saw Jesse there, he couldn't believe it. Well, he, <clears throat> even with Charlie there, there was nothing we could do to get Jesse out of the airplane. We just, we just couldn't do it. Uh, people have asked if we ever thought of cutting his leg off. Well, the, the thought crossed our minds, but under the circumstances, we just couldn't do it. We couldn't get a grip to enable us to, to uh, do any kind of a job like that. Uh, Jesse was almost dead anyhow. So Charlie pulled me aside after a while and said that <clears throat> because it was getting dark, he couldn't fly in the mountains because the helicopters weren't instrumented to fly in mountainous terrain. <clears throat> and he gave me the choice of uh, going, with him, going back with him or staying with Jesse. Well, I knew it was suicide to have stayed with Jesse because how long Jesse would, would uh, survive, I don't know. Uh, we weren't even sure when he passed away. So obviously I opted to go with, uh, with Charlie and I had to tell Jesse that we were leaving, but we had to get more equipment to help get him out. He didn't, he didn't indicate that he heard me at all, 
so he may have been in one of his uh, his situations of, of not speaking, or I think he may have passed away by that time. <coughs> <coughs> But it ripped both of us apart to have to leave him there. So uh, we were, incidentally, at about 5,000 feet, between four and 5,000 feet above sea level at this time. Um, there are no signs to me that there are troops in the area, but I was told by some people later on there were troops. Enemy troops? Enemy troops, yeah. <clears throat> but by this time they had about 15 airplanes flying over the site and uh, anybody would have been mad to have, with all those airplanes up there to run to the to the wreckage or give us a hard time but Charlie took me down to a base camp at the foot of the reservoir this is the chosen reservoir we spent 15 minutes on the ground. I stayed in the airplane while he got instructions from his superiors of what to do. And while I was in the airplane by myself, a number of the, of the troops, Marines and Army, stuck their heads in. After this withdrawal, they probably came 10 or 15 miles they were all bearded. They were just worn out. Uh, they were desperate to get out of there. They were hoping they could get a ride in the helicopter. Well, of course, there's no room for them. So we took off and went to another base camp, which is about 12 miles farther on south, down the valley. And the Marines put put Charlie and me up in a in a uh, called a pyramid tent, which is designed for four people. But there were already eight people in there, and so the two of us made ten people lying on the ground. And um, both Charlie and I just had our flying gear on, nothing really warm. And some kid, a Marine, he, he gave me his uh, sleeping bag. I don't know what he would have done, but I couldn't have survived the night without that. I could hardly sleep at all that night, but uh, about every 15 or 20 minutes, uh, one of the Marines would get up and go outside in the cold and start a Jeep. The Jeep had a radio in it. They had to make sure that, and it was powered by the Jeep itself. And he had to make sure it worked so that if any of the uh, enemy who were in the area got close. He had to be able to radio for help right away. So we got through the night okay, and then the next morning, Charlie took me to uh, <clears throat> a Marine air station, which is probably about 30 miles farther on down there, <clears throat> a seaport called Hung Nam. And the weather was too bad at that time for any airplanes to come in from the ship, so uh, <clears throat> I stayed there for t two more nights. And on Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, uh, an airplane came in from the ship and, and uh, took me out to the ship. And that was the last I saw of Charlie Ward. And when I got out to the ship, the captain had me come up to the bridge and uh, said his plan was to go as close to offshore as he could get the carrier and he was going to launch a helicopter with a flight surgeon and bring Jesse's body back. But the circumstances were such that it would be very dangerous. And um, I, I told the captain, as find a gesture as it was that it wasn't worth the life of uh, the pilot and the flight surgeons. So his plan, his backup plan was to send some airplanes out with napalm and uh, which he did <clears throat> and they dropped the napalm on Jesse's plane and on our and my airplane. 
So there's sort of a Valkyrian funeral pyre for uh, Jesse. And uh, they've never, it was so far up in North Korea that they've never recovered or have any signs of the airplane that he was in. Did you ever speak with Jesse's family oh, after yes. this? Not a lot. He was born and grew up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And uh, his wife, they had one child, Daisy, and um, Mrs. Brown, you know, you know, Mrs. Brown was Daisy, the child was Pam, Pamela. And uh, Daisy later on married a retired Air Force Master Sergeant and then he died several years later. She didn't remarry after that, but she's living still in Hattiesburg. And Pamela had two children, and I think each of those two children have three other children. I'm not sure of that. But I've, I've seen Daisy probably about four or five times since then. Most recent was uh, last spring. I was invited to go down to uh, Jackson, Mississippi, <clears throat> and they invited her there too, so that we were together for a while there. Was this for some honor ceremony? Excuse me? Was it for an honor or a ceremony yeah, with the, regards the, to Jesse? The, uh, the veterans down in Jackson, Mississippi had a, uh, a veterans affair that lasted several days and Jackson, Mississippi is about 50, 60 miles from Hattiesburg, so she came over with some friends of hers, and we partook of uh, the ceremonies there. And she, she, she's in her late 70s now, and a retired school teacher, and held in very high regard by the people of Hattiesburg, and a very very proud of Jesse, who uh, overcame so many obstacles to, uh, to get into the Navy and to read and to hear about what he and Daisy went through. It makes you wonder how humans can act that way to one another. <clears throat> and that was back then. So Things you, are a lot better today. You were given your medal for the attempted... Yeah. This has obviously stayed with you for your your whole life. Oh yeah. Well, it's I don't I don't it, I make no effort to make this even a center part of my life, but it's a reality that it is. And um, I I and most of the other recipients of this medal feel the same the way that we have an, we have a tremendous obligation because of the high visibility of the medal and what it stands for. This stands for every person who's ever put on a uniform to fight for America. And what we, each one of us individually did, may well have been done by others who were never seen or recognized or appreciated by somebody that that action should be noted and uh, appropriately awarded. And uh, so we all have a, a great sense of obligation. Uh, we wear it for, for everybody. And um, I feel very humbled by it. I'm proud, but nevertheless humbled by it because of the numbers of people who have sacrificed so much and have gotten no recognition for it at all. So how long after did you um, stay in that area or did you come back to the States? Well, they were working frantically to uh, get ships back into commission, get tanks, and get men in the service. And <clears throat> so it was on the 20th of January that we were recalled so they needed the ship back in the Mediterranean. So that's 1951? That was 51. And we in the air wing were flown back 
from Japan, flown back to Quonset Point, <coughs> and the ship came back through the Panama Canal and up to Quonset Point where our airplanes were offloaded. <coughs> But they needed that ship back there in the Atlantic and to be in the Mediterranean because at, at that time we were so concerned about the Soviets, we even thought there was a possibility that they could have sent bombers over to New York or Washington. Now as uh, uh, strange as that may seem, anything could happen. So they had to have a presence in the Mediterranean so if any aircraft were detected, they were headed in, a, in an ominous direction that they could at least have somebody intercept them. So the Atlantic Fleet commander would, uh, felt very uncomfortable when he had to lose one of his carriers, even though it was for the Korean War. I'm sure there's no argument about it. <clears throat> but it left him a little bit uncovered for what his responsibilities were over in, the, in Europe. And now, ironically, we knew nothing about the dangers of North Korea. We di didn't ha have any idea of their intentions until that actual attack. Here we are, uh, 67 years later, and uh, or 57 years later, and we know, we know how dangerous the North Koreans are. It's so much more dangerous because even though we had the atomic bomb at that time, <clears throat> we had, I think, pretty good confidence that it wouldn't be used. But now we have madmen who uh, have control over that in various forms of chemical warfare and biological warfare, we're living in a, in a very fearsome time. How long after that did you, uh, did you make this a career or did yeah. you get discharged? You were a career? No, I, I stayed in, uh, I stayed in until 1972 when I retired. And your rank was captain? captain? Was it difficult for you to retire? Well, uh, yeah, I loved the Navy, uh, but I knew that I wasn't going to make Admiral, and I wanted to get out before I was forced by law to get out when I was still young enough to uh, start a different career. And what career did you start? Well, at that time, I went off <clears throat> had an opportunity to work in a 100-year-old uh, uh, food processing company in, outside of Boston. It was an administrative position, which, which seemed strange. It, was, it had been bought by an aerospace company that made <clears throat> rocket engines. But they figured that the rocket technology was very close to the technology they used to uh, process foods. Well, it turned out that it wasn't too good a decision because the company finally moved out of Boston, was bought up by another country company. <clears throat> so I, I knocked around doing different things after that. But the most significant was that my last job was uh, <clears throat> Commission of Veterans Services for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I went into that office in 1987 as deputy commissioner, <clears throat> and then after Governor Weld was elected governor, <clears throat> he appointed me as commissioner, and I retired from that position in uh, 1999. Was that the position then taken on by Tom Kelly? Yes. And we've interviewed Tom Kelly oh, also, a very, very nice gentleman, and a good uh, interview with him, too. Well, I told him to be good to everybody. <laughs> so you came home, you went back and worked in the public sector, um, you got married. Did you join or stay with any um, military or veterans organizations? Well, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a 
a member but not a very active participant of a lot of veterans organizations. The American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, <clears throat> Disabled American Veterans, Korean War Veterans. Uh, I was <clears throat> president for several years of the uh, New England Council of the USO. Uh, there, I'm uh, what they call a Dedalian, which is an association of former military pilots. Um, Do you still stay in touch with some of your original uh, friends yes. from the Navy? Uh, oh yes, not a lot of them, but from that original squadron, which was Fighter Squadron 32, I didn't identify that, <coughs> VF-32. Uh, several of them live down in the Norfolk area, and I communicate with them a little bit. They have a reunion about every other year, but I've made only two of those reunions. Actually, there are a lot of reunions that, uh, of, of different organizations that, that I go to. And uh, it gets a little expensive to go to to a lot of these things. <laughs> Wrapping this up a bit, how important do you feel um, your serving in the military is and how did it affect your life after the military? Well, when I grew up, I th think most of us were very conscious of uh, what America was about. Um, when I went through school, most of our classmates' parents had been in World War I, or a number of them had been in World War I. <clears throat> Among our studies, I went to prep school, and uh, among our studies, great emphasis on history. And I've seen everybody has, has to have taken American history to graduate. And I had an appreciation of uh, what the United States was all about and how fortunate we are to be American citizens. But I still didn't have full appreciation for it until uh, later on, and especially the last few years, when I can see uh, how dangerous the world is that we're living in and how little sense of knowledge so many American citizens have about how much it cost us to be where we are today. <clears throat> and I have great, uh, great concern about some of our decision makers and people in positions of, of uh, decision and responsibility who criticize the actions <clears throat> that are being taken by the administration to save us. You know, we had 9-11. That should make <clears throat> every American citizen aware of the fact that there are some people who will do anything at all to act literally to destroy America. And my, one of my, one of my many pet peeves is the uh, objection to the Patriot Act, uh, feeling that imposing on personal liberties, whereas we need something like that to let us know <clears throat> of any action that's being contemplated against the United States. And this isn't just against a, a few certain individuals, but this is to as many Americans that they can possibly destroy for no reason at all, except for their misguided beliefs. And something's going to happen. Every, I think almost everybody has accepted the fact that something's going to happen someday. And knowing that, why should there be any question about our doing everything in our power to avoid that from happening? And as we close, is there anything else, a statement you'd like to make to your family, to the people watching this tape, to finish off this tape? 
I think that families should inculcate uh, the spirit of patriotism in their children, and this should be passed down through generations. And I think one of the things that bothers me most is that in academia, that there, there's not a, a, a great emphasis on what it means to be an American and how much it costs and uh, that a lot of the things that we have done throughout our history may not have seemed to be the right thing to do at the time, but that we have been blessed to be part of the greatest country that has ever existed. We have, when they, when they criticize us for such things as our slavery, we have no nation in the, this world has ever done anything more to eliminate the discrimination, not only among <clears throat> other races, but uh, discrimination among various elements of our society. And that mistakes have been made. A lot of things that we criticize so much, you look back over the <clears throat> decades, were the accepted thing in that time. Another example is the detention of the Japanese in detention camps during the war. We're fighting for our very existence. And uh, Roosevelt's decision to, to uh, put the Japanese in, they weren't concentration camps. They were just camps to separate them from the rest of the citizens because we had no idea what was going to happen. Uh, I think too many decisions are being made for strictly political purposes that have no <clears throat> connection with what the reality of the conditions we're living in today. And I also get upset about academia looking down so much on the military, which is a very honorable profession. And it's ironic. <clears throat> that when you talk about some of the, the uh, favorite institutions in this country, um, you talk about the Congress, which is unbelievably low in the minds of American people, the law, and I'm not saying that I agree with these general perceptions of the American people, but the American military is up, up near the top but it's, it's, it's often dangerous for the military people to be in some environments around here. Retired Captain Thomas Hudner, I want to thank you. This was definitely a history lesson for all of us watching this tape and listening to you today. Well, thank you for coming in. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. An honor to have been asked to be with you.